cloud. And all right, so um, part three, yeah? Part three. Let's go. Okay, so the last couple of times we've gone through the definitions and the initial examples for uh, viscosity solutions. We've talked about the maximum principle and the theorem of sums. Those are the heavy lifting portions of this presentation. Today, we have what looks like a lot of material to go through, but in fact, I'm going to fly through it pretty quickly, relatively speaking, especially compared to the last two times, because we're just going to be introducing some brand new ideas, kind of justifying, I suppose, why we're interested in showing some other tools that we may have access to. Uh, one other thing I'll point out, and I say this at the end as well, is that there are a few sources in my bibliography that I include that I don't actually talk about in the presentation, but I include them there if you're interested in learning more. Uh, Michael Crandall is a great author for talking about viscosity solutions, um, as is uh, Petri Utenin, and then uh, Manfredi, uh, Juan Manfredi, has a great introduction to the P. Laplacian and RN, and uh, I've actually provided a link to that presentation. So if you're interested, feel free to go through all the sources and check those things out. And let's see, it looks to me like it's time for me to go ahead and navigate to section three and then go to presentation mode. All right. So what we're going to find out is that uh, obviously from previous sections, we already know that a classical solution is a viscosity solution. It's easy to see that that's true, but because viscosity solutions only need to be continuous, there's absolutely nothing guaranteeing that once you find a viscosity solution, it is in fact a classical solution to a PDE. So it's interesting to think about that comparison and also to wonder if there are comparisons between other notions of solutions for PDEs and viscosity solutions. And usually when we say other notions anymore, we mean weak solutions in particular. So what we're going to do, we're gonna be talking about uh, weak solutions, and then we're also gonna be talking about harmonic solutions, uh, p-harmonic functions, I guess I should say, because we're gonna find out that there is a nice back and forth relationship between those notions of solutions and viscosity solutions, at least in a lot of cases. And as before, just a little bit of general administrative work, we're going to assume that F is continuous, proper, and degenerate elliptic for this particular section. And we're going to generally pose Dirichlet type problems. So some background for people who don't know it, we're going to use this terminology when we talk about test functions, or sometimes you'll also hear them called bump functions, uh, co uh, compactly su supported smooth functions. They are used a lot in the theory of weak solutions. And what we're going to say is that if I have a function over a measurable set A, which is, uh, let's say, LP, and I have, I'm not sure exactly the terminology I want to use for it, we're going to have an integer uh, n-tuple, alpha. It consists of integers m1 through mn, each of which is non-negative, with the property that m1 plus 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 mn is less than or equal to k, then we say that the function u is going to have a weak derivative and it's going to belong to the Sobolev space wkp over a. If there exists a function v alpha, really I guess I should, uh, yeah, v alpha is a fine terminology here, which also belongs to lp just like u, and it satisfies this uh, integration by parts type formula as long as I integrate against the test function eta. The idea here is that we're using one of the major I, I, properties. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I have a question. Uh, Go ahead. <clears throat> because uh, don't you need either, because what is your test functions? Because if A is, uh, uh, they sh because this for this to be true, uh, the test function should have compact. So if it's the, a domain, they have to have compact support. Otherwise, so, it's it's not true. I mean, it's it's about it's integration by parts. It's not even true for C infinity function. That's a good point. That means that in fact I've messed up the uh, set A here. So let me go ahead and make a quick note of that here, so people understand. Okay, so uh, what Dr. Kavinson is talking about here is the fact that I use the symbol A for a measurable set, but the problem here is that really I need to be able to talk about test functions that are compactly supported in A somehow, which means that A needs to have 
something inside of which to be compactly supported. So usually when I say A here, I'm trying to be fairly general, but really usually we're talking about an open set or we're talking about a domain, something like that. In those cases, then this formula makes sense because usually integration by parts doesn't work out to be quite so nice because you have to have some kind of boundary terms. All right, and then test functions should be uh, supporting in A, not in just Rn. Correct. The, yeah. Absolutely correct. That's also another really good point. So I may as well go ahead and talk about that as well. And I think by now I found out that there's a, I don't know what I want to call it. There's a certain uh, trickiness to how this uh, software likes to let me annotate. There we go. So here I say supported in RN. Well, really that shouldn't be the case here. I should be talking about omega in particular, if I'm going to use omega here. And when I say test function down below, I should say test function, and it should be compactly supported smooth functions in A, like that, assuming that A is of the type that allows me to do this. That's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. With those changes in mind, what I'm doing uh, here is just giving you some quick remarks here. Uh, you'll notice that previously I talked about D alpha U. Uh, it's not exactly a gradient. It's actually just the product of partial derivatives. What I do is I simply take the partial derivative of X1 and I'm doing it M one order of U. Then I take a partial derivative of U with respect to X2 to the M2 order derivative. And I just keep on doing that over and over again. That's what I mean when I talk about uh, D alpha on the previous page. Well, I think that's even different from what's in um, Evans, yeah? Evans has it where it's, um, it's the alpha with order derivative. So absolute value of alpha, I guess, M1 plus Mn. And it's just the partial with respect to all of those variables. So it's like a really big partial, not the product. Because it's, it's still a linear operator, D alpha. You may be right. I may have actually written this down incorrectly. I'll double check. I, I don't correct think it. it means product. I think it just. What I just said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a usual Laurent Schwartz section notation. Yeah, that should be what it is. And I'll correct the notation here so it looks better. Uh, usually we're going to simply write D alpha U alpha order derivative in place of V alpha. We're not typically going to uh, write down V alpha instead. And if we mean a weak derivative, we're just going to say that U belongs to the Sobolev space WKP. Uh, ah, yes. This is the last one. We need this a little bit later on in particular. Uh, if we have A that has a nice enough boundary, what we're going to sometimes talk about is functions that belong to WKP zero. And what that means is in the trace sense, typically, although it might also be in the usual sense, the function is zero on the boundary. And if you're wondering what I mean when I say in the trace sense, well, what I mean is I'm taking this function U, which is LP, and I'm acting upon it with an operator. The operator makes a function on the boundary and that function has certain properties. In this case, it's going to be uh, zero on the boundary in the, sense, uh, in the sense of trace. Ah, and then of course we have here the idea that uh, if you have something which is classically differentiable and also can be integrated, then of course, things that are classically differentiable and can be integrated, of course, should be inside the Sobolev space. All right, so now if I have an equation that looks like, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and annotate here. I left it so I could annotate it myself when I needed to. If I have an equation of the Dirichlet type problem for the interior condition, which means I'm talking about F of U at X, or in other words, uh, F at the point X, U of X, gradient, assuming that I have such a thing as a gradient, and then Hessian is equal to zero. If I multiply by a test function, and then I use integration by parts, just assuming that I have a smooth function right now for W, I can end up getting this integral equation. So I'll put a negative on the outside, I'll have an inner product between things in here, and I'll have this brand new operator, which will be not second order anymore, but first order. 
this is important to us. Well, hold on a question. Okay. Are you guaranteed to be able to do that for, um, what were these? it was called on um, degenerate elliptic operators? Um, I believe you are able to do that for degenerate elliptic operators. I need to go back and double check here. I know that in Evans, he, and so this would all be coming from Evans uh, chapter eight on the calculus of variations. He takes in those senses, I, I'm trying to think, is it an elliptic operator? I don't think so. I think he takes a, just a second order operator and he does a very similar thing. So I'm duplicating that argument here to try and give you a sense of it. Okay. Because I know it's possible for at least linear, but it's just, um... I believe it is also possible here. If I'm incorrect, somebody please feel free to speak up and correct me, but I believe I that it is correct. Maybe last talk or two talks ago, you could put in divergence form that it's possible. But uh, is it always possible to put equations like that in divergence form? That's a good question. And I don't think the answer is yes here. Actually, this is kind of going to tie into something I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this section. But uh, right now, there are results showing that in certain environments, uh, RN is one of them, Heisenberg group, Carnot groups, you can show that certain operators uh, will have both weak and viscosity solutions, and they're going to be equivalent to one another. However, typically, when you talk about weak and viscosity solutions being equivalent, uh, at least the papers I have seen, it's been about operators such as uh, P. Laplacian. Okay. In those cases, then yes, there's an equivalence back and forth. I don't know that it happens all the time here. And in fact, uh, this is a really good point to raise because I've been trying to uh, nail this down as I go through the presentation myself. I don't believe it's true all the time, but I couldn't say one way or the other for sure. Okay, cool. Good question. Thank you. Uh, okay, what was I saying? Ah, uh, yes. For technical reasons, a lot of times we don't want to use a test function anymore. Up above, I said I wanted to use a compactly supported and smooth function in order to make this work, but I don't actually need something quite that nice. As long as I have something that has a weak notion of derivative and is <clears throat> compact and LP and has uh, the, the zero trace property, then the equation would still make sense. And the only thing we would need to ensure in that case is that our function W that you're seeing here that we're putting into the operator F hat would have to be weakly differentiable at least once. So it would have to belong to a Sobolev space 1P. This is kind of hinting at the idea of weak solutions. So erasing here, he said with hope in his heart that he doesn't necessarily have any justification to feel. Come on. So erasing here, in our case, bearing in mind what Nathan said, that this may not necessarily be possible if you don't have something that is in divergence form or similar, we're going to call you a weak solution for the Dirichlet type problem uh, that we've talked about before. If U is Sobolev 1P, it's equal to G on the boundary in either the classical or the trace sense and it satisfies the integral problem that we were looking at just a moment ago. Under those circumstances, we'll consider it to be not only a solution for the integral equation, but also for our Dirichlet type problem. Uh, you'll notice here that I talk about the Lebesgue exponent P. Well, it's actually necessary for uh, variational calculus. And you'll notice here I've put a, a citation, but it's not actually a hyperlink. That's because I'm a dreadful person and forgot to actually reference Evan's work. I'll correct that in the final version. I should be keeping a log of the uh, changes I need to make, but I think I'll be able to remember. And there's always the video. And under some circumstances, we can actually weaken the requirement. We won't have to have U be Sobolev 1P in all of omega. We can just have it be Sobolev 1P locally, so in compact subsets of omega. This happens, for example, in a... Ooh, another little correction I need to make for later. This happens, for example, in a paper with Uten and Lindquist and Manfredi when they talk about equivalence between weak uh, P-harmonic and viscosity solutions for the P-Laplacian in RN. And this is basically the thrust of what I want to get to here. There are circumstances under which these notions of weak solution and the viscosity solutions are actually the same. I cannot say, I will not say that they are the same always. In fact, I doubt very much that's the case. Uh, 
But in the cases that I'm actually going to put on your screen now, they are known to be the same. They've been proven to be the same. So the Pelopossian and bounded domains, that was proven by uh, Lindquist and Manfredi. Fractional Pelopossians, that was proven by ooh, Barrios and Medina. That was actually just published this last year. I found it while doing research for uh, this presentation. Variable exponent uh, Pelopossian, so that would be P of X Laplacian in bounded domains. Uh, that is Utenin, uh, Lucari, and Parvianinen. Parabolic P. Laplacians, that was proven by Siltikowski. Uh, Hitoshi Ishii proves the equivalence for second order operators of a certain form. Uh, we have two stage Stefan problems in bounded domains, and RN will have a equivalence between weak and viscosity. I don't know much about that problem, but it's another one that I found while doing research for the presentation. Uh, and then there are a couple more that I'm familiar with more intimately. Infinity Laplacian in RN, that's Jensen's work. Uh, Infinity Laplacian in bounded domains of the Heisenberg group, H1, that's uh, Dr. Besky's work. And then P of X Laplacian in bounded domains in Carnot groups. Now that's Bob Freeman's work along with uh, uh, Tom, along with Dr. Besky. All of these are cases where the solutions end up being the same. Trying to prove they are the same is not simple at all. Uh, you can look at, I think, for example, a great one is uh, Utenin, Lindquist, and Manfredi. They go through some really nice arguments showing you how the uh, equivalence is established. One direction is not so bad. The other direction is technically very ugly. But it seems like never, neither direction is really obvious, though, yeah? Mm, um, no, neither one is ever really obvious. Uh, there are some ugly things that happen. Uh, for example, Jensen's paper, that would be J.E. here on the page. The approach that Jensen likes to take is Jensen starts out and uh, he proves that it's uh, he proves first that any uh, absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extension, which is basically what you would be talking about if you want to do a weak solution for the infinity Laplacian must also be a viscosity solution. Then he modifies the infinity Laplacian by changing it into two auxiliary functions. And he proves existence of uh, either weak or viscosity solutions to those auxiliary equations. He shows that under the right circumstances, those auxiliary equations produce solutions of an inhomogeneous infinity Laplacian. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that terminology, what I mean is, that he will have, uh, instead of infinity Laplacian, which is how we would normally write this, is equal to zero, it would be equal to epsilon or epsilon to some power like this. And then he allows epsilon to go to zero and proves that there is a cluster point, I believe using uh, arzela scali theorem, to prove that there is a cluster point of the solutions to these inhomogeneous equations, and it must solve also the infinity Laplacian homogeneous. It's a pain. But for Arcella Scholli, he needs to a priori bound on the derivative, which I know that uh, it happens in the case, it's kind of a mir miraculous, it happens in the case of Kila classing, because you have to have uniform continu uh, uh, continuity. Yes, that's true. And uh, actually, I cannot remember the exact argument for how it is established there. Um, I may actually be remembering it out of order. I do remember that Arzela Ascoli theorem is used somewhere in the proof. I think, and um, I'll have to check on this if any of you are interested in hearing a definite answer afterward, but I think that the actual place where you use Arzela Ascoli, if you need it, is in proving that... So let me see, I'm gonna try and write this down rather than say this aloud because it's too much to try and say aloud. And I'm gonna backtrack a little bit as well. Perhaps if I backtrack a little bit, I'll have enough space so I can write it. So thinking through this, and I had to read through this paper recently, while, which is why I'm uh, more or less remembering what happens here. I believe the arzela Ascoli theorem here is being used predominantly to show that if you have P Laplacian, and you try to solve P Laplacian, 
you can show, first of all, so uh, this would be appealing to maybe Utenin uh, and uh, Linquist Manfredi, that viscosity solutions are weak solutions. And then what you would do is you would allow P to go to infinity formally so that you are approaching to the infinity Laplacian and then would show that uh, the solutions UP to the infinity, infinity Laplacian or excuse me, the uh, solutions UP to the P Laplacian converge. Yeah, I think that's how you show it. I think you show that as P goes to infinity, the solutions to the P Laplacian converge using our Zela Scoli. And then I think everything after that may be playing around with uh, upper and lower bounds. In any case, I agree with Nathan's statement originally. It's not an easy thing to do. It's very technical and it requires a lot of careful estimation. Uh, we can also do more with the P Laplacian. So we can introduce what are called sub and super P sub and super harmonic functions, which I'll define here. If you look at the definition, you'll notice that sub and super harmonic functions, well, for right here, it's super harmonic functions I'm talking about predominantly. They're very similar to viscosity solutions definition. The big difference is that whereas viscosity solutions have in this step two, which hopefully I can highlight sometime today. In this step two, they have a statement about uh, C2 functions test, uh, touching from below, in the case of uh, viscosity super solutions. For a super harmonic function, you need to satisfy instead a comparison principle in, on compactly contained subdomains, which means that these sub and super harmonic functions are actually built from the beginning to be compared, whereas viscosity solutions, we have to prove that they can be compared. So similarly to viscosity theory, again, once we have this notion of superharmonic, we can give subharmonic as well by just saying V is uh, subharmonic as long as negative V is P superharmonic. And then if a function U is both superharmonic or P superharmonic and P subharmonic, then it's called P harmonic. And it turns out you can prove this as well. I know that Uten and Lindquist and Manfredi talk about this, that P harmonic functions are actually weak solutions to the P Laplacian. We have also this theorem here from Newton and Lindquist and Manfredi that if you're given a bounded domain omega and Rn, a function U is P superharmonic if and only if it is a viscosity super solution to the P Laplacian in omega. And as a corollary, we can show then that P harmonic functions and viscosity solutions and weak solutions are all one and the same for bounded domains in Rn. I'll also say as a kind of a parting shot here uh, for this section, that it is important that we talk about bounded domains here. For one thing, of course, we want to be able to have a bound, a boundary on which to compare functions. But for another thing, viscosity solutions don't behave very nicely in unbounded domains. I believe that this is section seven in the user's guide to viscosity solutions. But in one of the sections of the user's guide, uh, the authors explore what is necessary to have viscosity solutions in unbounded sets, and it is not pretty at all. You have to have all sorts of growth conditions on them that make things much more difficult. Anybody have any questions before I move on to uh, section four on Perron's method? Not yet. Okay. On well, that case, let's talk about Perron's. I keep teasing Nathan and saying that he's waiting for this, but I think he might actually be waiting for this. So is it teasing at that point? I'm not sure. Okay, so you'll notice from uh, section two that we have conditions under which if we have some sub and super solutions, or if we have solutions, we can compare them. And if we have solutions, we can show under the right conditions that they are unique, as long as you're talking about solutions in the sense of viscosity. So the question is, 
Under what circumstances do we actually have this costly solutions? And that's uh, not necessarily a trivial question at all. So one way to answer that would be to have something like Perron's method. And that's exactly what we're going to introduce here. We're going to introduce a version of Perron's method that works for viscosity solutions and produces viscosity solutions under certain restrictions on sub and super solutions as families. Uh, basically the idea, and this is an overview because I know that Brittany has said that she likes to have these overviews and frankly, I agree with her idea. Uh, what we do is we're going to produce family super solutions in the viscosity and they have to kind of nicely with respect to one another on the boundary of our domain we're going to be working with. And the idea here would then be, if I have a whole bunch of subsolutions, what happens if I take the, the supremum of all those subsolutions? Might that still be a subsolution? What about if I take the infimum of all the super solutions? Would that still be a super solution? The answer isn't exactly yes, because there are some subtleties here that have to be worked through, but this is the right direction. The idea then is if you can compare the supremum and infimum of these families, then hopefully we'll be able to produce something in between the two families, which is in fact a viscosity solution. And one thing I'm gonna throw up as a little bit of a warning here, I do have a couple of proofs, in particular for sections five and uh, four and five, I have precisely two. I have the proof of Perron's method at the very end where I take all the theorems and results that I'm going to state in just a moment and I put them all together to prove it, but I'm not gonna show the proofs of all of the intermediate results because they were very technical and time consuming. And we've already been doing this now for two weeks. So I don't know that we really want to extend it that much more. Uh, and then in section five, I have a proof of a parabolic comparison principle for viscosity solutions. And uh, the only extra result really we really need to talk about in there, apart from the comparison principle, is a parabolic theorem of sums, which is, if possible, even uglier than the original degenerate elliptic case. So we're just not going to touch that one. All right, just as a, a bit of information for students unfamiliar with this, we're going to use what we call upper and lower semi-continuous envelopes. You take functions and what you do is you produce from them upper and lower semi-continuous functions by using this lim soup or this lim inf. If you're not sure about the lim soup and the lim inf, remember that we actually talked about these in chapter one. I don't remember the slide. It was somewhere in the middle. And I will take a moment right here to see if I can find it for you. Ah, yes. We talk about lim soup and lim inf here. This is, uh, I do not remember which slide, but in section one. So if you are confused, feel free to go back and look at that in the printouts that I've already given. And hopefully you all agree with me that it's pretty obvious if I have a function which is already upper semi continuous and I take the upper semi continuous envelope of it, then I should just get the function back again and ditto for lower semi-continuous functions. So we're going to have a lemma that we're going to need. It is the first major stepping stone in the proof of Perron's theorem. And so the idea here is we're going to have a function, an operator f, rather than requiring it to be continuous, we only need it to be lower semi-continuous, although usually we have better behaved uh, operators. It's going to be proper and degenerate elliptic. And what we're going to do is let F, little funky F here, be the collection of all viscosity subsolutions to the equation FW is equal to zero in O, where O is just locally compact. We're going to define W to be the supremum of all of the functions in the family F. And it turns out that if W star, that would be the upper semi-continuous envelope of W is finite in O, then it turns out that it also is going to be a viscosity subsolution. Now, if you remember your definitions for viscosity subsolutions here, you'll remember that that means that I need to be able to produce jets, or rather, if I have jets, I have to be able to show that certain results are obtained. And that's going to be a little bit tricky here since we're taking supremums. So in order to prove this lemma, the authors Crandall, Ishii, and Lyons have to introduce a proposition, which is every single bit is technical. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to approximate the jets, or rather really the jet closures almost, of our function w. We're going to do this with the proposition stating if v is upper semi-continuous, it has a jet entry, an upper jet entry, for some point x naught. And if we can produce a sequence of points, a sequence of upper semi-continuous functions with the property that the points and the functions evaluated the, at those points converge to x naught and to our upper semi-continuous function v at x naught. And if it turns out moreover that the limb supremum as n goes to infinity of vn of xn is less than or equal to v at x naught, then we can produce points x hat n in O and jet entries for vn at each point x hat n so that the tuples x hat n, vn at x hat n, eta n and xn converge to x naught, v of x naught, eta x. It sounds really ugly, but the reason for this is we need to be able to approximate the behavior of W using these uh, functions Vn that are close by. We know when we are looking at our previous lemma that we can find upper semi-continuous functions, which are viscosity subsolutions, which will converge point-wise to W. And so what we're going to do is use the fact that each of those functions is a subsolution to try and show that W itself must also be a subsolution thanks to semi-continuity of the operator F. I won't linger on that for too long. The proof can be found in Crandall, Ishi, and Lyons, but that is the idea behind this lemma and the proposition supporting it. Everybody okay with this? That's a thumbs up from Nathan. Brittany, I'm gonna pick on you again. Are you okay with this? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I can't see your face today, so I can't know for sure. I'm sleepy. <laughs> and that's an excuse? <laughs> <Go on. laughs> okay, the next major we result we need in producing Perron's uh, method is something called a bump function construction. It's in the form of this lemma here, which says that if we have a function which belongs to the family F of subsolutions. And if we find out that the lower semi-continuous envelope of V is not a super solution, then near that point, choosing small kappa greater than zero, I can produce a subsolution V kappa, and it's going to be a bump function in the sense that it's greater than or equal to V everywhere. The supremum of V kappa minus V is going to be strictly positive and outside of a little neighborhood around the point X naught where V, uh, v sub star fails to be a, sub, a super solution, V kappa and V are actually identical to one another. To put that into a picture, however, because I don't think that this description really shows you what's going on, we'll have a situation like this where we have a function V V turns out is not a super solution at a point somewhere in the middle. So what I'll do is I'll make V kappa. And V kappa will look exactly like V outside of a small neighborhood, outside of where I put these two uh, lines on the X axis. But between those two lines, V kappa is gonna be strictly larger and it will kind of rise above almost like a bump or a bubble above the function V. This is going to be crucial for the next proof, and it's going to make everything super, super easy. Because we now finally have the statement of Perron's theorem. If we have a function which is continuous, proper, and degenerate elliptic F, if we have a bounded open set, F has a comparison principle, just like theorem 2.3 back in section two, and we have a Dirichlet type problem with the boundary data G is equal to zero, if we have viscosity sub and super solutions, um, U underline and U bar, such that the lower semi-continuous envelope of U underline equals zero equals the upper semi-continuous envelope of U bar on the boundary. And if we define big W to be the supremum of the, of, uh, the intersection between upper semi-continuous functions between our two half solutions, and the family F, then W is the unique viscosity solution to the Dirichlet type problem. 
there's a lot on here, but the proof, it turns out, is actually quite straightforward once we have the two lemmas and the proposition. So the proof. Well, the first part of the proof is really easy. Because of the definitions of what we're working with here, it's really simple to see that the lower semi-continuous envelope of U under bar is going to be less than or equal to the lower semi-continuous envelope of W. That in turn must be less than or equal to W, which is less than or equal to the upper semi-continuous envelope, which is less than or equal to, et cetera. This means that on the boundary, W and each of its semi-continuous envelopes are going to be equal. And because of the way that we formed W, because it is a supremum that is taken over a family of subsolutions, it turns out that it must be equal to its own upper semi-continuous envelope and a subsolution in omega. That part is pretty easy. Hopefully you agree with me, and if not, feel free to stop me. The next part is a little bit trickier, and it requires that bump function. function. <laughs> I have to be careful with my stutters here. <laughs> Almost had an oopsie there. <laughs> Almost. I'm too good for oopsies, though. <laughs> he said with hope in his heart. Uh, so one observation that we have to make here is that if I take W lower semi-continuous regularization, uh, the lower semi-continuous envelope, and then if I take the lower semi-continuous envelope of W and I take the lower semi-continuous envelope of that, just like we said before in a previous observation, they must be equal. So if we assume that that function is not a super solution, then we can appeal to our bump construction. We can choose kappa and we can produce a function W lower sem semi-continuous envelope kappa which is actually larger than the function W, and that's a problem. It causes us to have a contradiction because the way we've chosen W, it has to be a supremum. So because of that, we arrive at the observation that W and W lower semi-continuous envelope must be the same, and they must be a super solution. Put all this together, and the consequence is that W is continuous in all of omega and up to the boundary, and it's going to be unique because at this point, it is a viscosity solution to a, an operator that has a comparison principle. So automatically by our corollary, it will be unique. And I will say, as I let you ponder over this and decide if you have questions for me, it's uh, kind of beautiful how this result comes out, because as I mentioned, the previous lemmas in the proposition are very technical, and they require some very careful thought to see how they are done. I wouldn't call them hard, but as we've observed before, sometimes the methods in the user's guide are not necessarily straightforward, and they take some very careful work to prove them. So to have such technical results followed by this very easy and relatively straightforward proof which produces existence for viscosity solutions, it's uh, very nice. How does everybody feel about this? Do you have questions for me or would you like to move on to parabolic degenerate elliptic equations? It's okay, I say move on. I mean, that's, a, that's the beauty of lemmas, yeah? Um, the theorem is easy as long as the lemmas are, everything, all the technical stuff is just pushed into lemmas. I suppose, I've seen people do it differently, but I do like that approach, I have to admit. Kind of like watching the sunrise. <laughs> Look at me being a poet. Trying to be a poet. All right. So this very last section, we're going to be talking about parabolic equations. What we're going to do is we're going to have a continuous operator, F, just like we had before. Although you'll notice that I haven't said proper and degenerate elliptic here, and that's for a very good reason. We're going to assume, in this case, that unlike the previous cases, the point x, well, the point is not going to be just x. It should be x and t. So we're dealing with evolution equations. And what we're going to do is make a Cauchy Dirichlet type problem using this operator. It's going to look like the t derivative plus f acting on the function is equal to zero. 
uh, the function is equal to zero if we extend the boundary of omega up in the t variable. And on the initial conditions, on the closure of the uh, domain omega, w is going to just be equal to some continuous function, which I'm calling psi for right now. However, this isn't the nicest way to talk about the problem. It's a good way to introduce the problem because it's kind of easy to read. However, most typically you don't see it written this way. And that's because what I'm going to do from now on is write omega t whenever I mean the parabola, well, the parabolic shape or the cylindrical shape, I guess I should say, omega cross with the interval zero t. And the second thing is I'm going to introduce what I call the parabolic boundary. And the parabolic boundary is just the union of the two boundary sets that we deal with up above in the problem CDP. If I use this notation, then I can actually simplify everything just a little bit. And I can rewrite the problem like this with a function sigma being the unified boundary condition. So the question is, can we actually do viscosity solutions for this sort of problem? And of course, the answer is yes, because otherwise, why would I be talking to you about it? But we're going to have to modify our definitions. The first one of which is going to be modifying a proper and degenerate elliptic. The authors in the user's guide don't use this terminology. I'm going to use it here just to make things a little bit clearer, hopefully. I'm going to say that F over Rn plus one cross R cross, et cetera, is parabolically proper in degenerate elliptic. If F is proper in degenerate elliptic, every single time I fix a value T. So if I fix the time component T and then I let everything else be a variable as before, then F is going to be degenerate elliptic and proper in the normal sense. I'm also going to jump directly to the idea of the, uh, the touching above and below functions. In this case, when I talk about touching above and below functions, they can't just be C2. They have to be C2 in the spatial directions, but they have to be C1 in the time direction. And once I have touching above and touching below functions, I can define the jets more or less like I did last time. You'll notice that this time I have to also include the T derivative, but otherwise everything is basically the same. It just adds an extra component. And our definitions for sub and super solutions are going to be very similar. The only real difference actually is in the criterion three and in the criterion three prime that I have here, because I'm going to require comparison on the boundary of the set O. I don't know why I have a bar over top of O here. It's not necessary. Another edit for my edit book. But it's going to look very much the same as what we did last time. The only real difference is that we're requiring that they have this boundary comparison to the, the boundary data to begin with. And we're also going to have to change the, the theorem of sums to a parabolic version. The biggest change is not the changes that we make to the functions u, although we do have to change the functions ui, so that way they're upper semi-continuous not only spatially, but also uh, temporally, as I like to say. They're, we're also going to have to change a condition down here, because in the previous theorem of sums, all we had to do was satisfy the stuff up top and we were good to go. In this version of the theorem of sums, however, we're going to have to ensure that this condition is also satisfied. In effect, what this condition means is that we have to have points on the inside of the cylinder omega t. We really don't want to have points on the boundary. We want to make sure that our points are right in the middle of omega t. Otherwise, we're going to run into issues. Once we have that criterion satisfied, the rest looks almost identical to what we did before. We're going to have entries in the closure of the jets. We're going to have a matrix bound 
And the only other major difference is that we're going to have in each of the JET entries or the JET closure entries, a time component BI for each function UI. And the information we have about the numbers BI is that if I add B1 through BK all together, the result is the T derivative of the function psi. Once we have that, we can state the parabolic comparison principle. Unlike the last couple of things that we had to review and change, this one doesn't really require much changes. It requires all of the parabolic environment information that we had before. But actually, apart from that, it's mostly the same as our original comparison principle. The only real difference here that I can spot, apart from the slight updates to our environment, is that in our original uh, comparison principle, you'll remember we had to have a lower bound condition for the function f, and we also had an upper bound condition with a function theta for f. Well, in our case, we actually don't need to have the lower bound condition, and we'll see why in just a minute. We do need the upper bound condition, and it needs to be changed so that it holds for every single value t in the interval from zero to big T. Apart from that, though, the theorem is going to be very similar. I'm going to highlight where it differs. The really big leap here in this proof is that I can assume that u is going to tend to negative infinity uniformly as t goes to big T, and I'm also going to assume that it is a strict subsolution in the viscosity sense and satisfies that inequality below. The reason for this is actually pretty straightforward, although it's not obvious at first glance. Instead of working with u, I could always work with u plus, and I'm going to double check my work here to make sure I don't say something very silly, because that would make me feel bad if I said something too silly. Ah, uh, yes. I'm going to replace u by uh, u plus negative epsilon over big T minus T. If I know that u is just a subsolution, then I can absolutely show that u plus this extra term satisfies the conditions that I'm imposing here. And of course, if I allow epsilon to go to zero, then I'm going to be able to get the same result for my function u as I do for this function here. So from the beginning, I'm just going to assume that u tends to negative infinity uniformly as t goes to big T, and that satisfies a strict subsolution property. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Just like last time, I'm going to say that delta is going to be the supremum of the difference of u and v, this time over the cylinder omega t. And I'm going to assume that delta is greater than zero. Now, here's the problem. I need to show that condition 5.1 from the parabolic theorem of sums holds, the really ugly one that involved basically every single component of the jet entries. And in order to do that, what I have to do is backtrack and almost do something like the maximum principle, but not quite as involved. I'm going to define m alpha almost like I did last time, except taking into account the cylinders. And what I'm going to do is observe the fact that if the maximum occurs, and it occurs in particular when t is equal to zero, then I wind up with the equation that m alpha is going to be equal to sigma of x zero minus sigma of y zero minus the distance squared times alpha over two for appropriate x and y. And the problem is, the right-hand side is going to tend to zero as alpha goes to infinity. That wouldn't be so bad except for one fact. We observed it last time. And that is, oh man, come on, let me annotate. And that is that M alpha should always be greater than or equal to delta, which we have said is strictly greater than zero. So if this were true, we have a contradiction. That can't be. So obviously, wherever this uh, maximum occurs, it must be somewhere where t is between 0 and big T. It cannot be equal to 0. Because of that, we know that the conditions for the parabolic uh, 
comp- uh, the, the parabolic theorem of sums, excuse me, must be satisfied. And so we can apply it automatically to get elements of the jet closures, which you can see here. If I plug them in into the proper places in our function f and I subtract just like we did in the previous theorem, we end up with an inequality that looks like what I've written below. And there are only really two things to do. The first is that if I do b minus a, b minus a has to be zero. That may sound a little bit funny at first, but remember that we already know that if we add all of the time components, thanks to the parabolic theorem of sums, it should give me the derivative of my C2 function spatially, C1 function temporally. And because our function was the distance function that doesn't take into account time, the time derivative must be zero. So that shows why B and A go away. Everything else behaves almost exactly like what we had before. So we apply the same sorts of arguments, uh, bounding the difference above by theta, and then simply let alpha go to infinity to show that we arrive at a contradiction in exactly the same way as before. Everybody okay with this proof? At least makes tentative sense. That was kind of a tentative thumbs up, Nathan, but I'll accept it for now. I haven't heard from Fudong yet today, and I've already teased Brittany, so I think I have to mess with Fudong. Fudong, everything good? Yeah, good. Okay, now that Fudong has said, yep, it's good, and that wasn't tons of fun, now I have to mess with Brittany. Brittany? I gave my thumbs up already. I can't here. see you. How do I'll I do know if you have a thumbs up? No, I'll, I'll do it again there. Okay, now that I'll accept. That I could see on my screen. Okay. <laughs> it's not real unless I see it, which is bad news for <laughs> quantum mechanics. <laughs> for a lot of things. <laughs> for a lot of things. And that's really all I wanted to say for today. It's kind of anticlimactic in some senses since the last couple of times we've had long involved discussions about so much, but it's like Nathan said, it's kind of nice to have put in so much hard work and then come to the end and have something relatively simple once all the technical stuff is out of the way. So I open the floor to you guys. Questions, anybody? So I have one, um, unless someone else wants to go first. No, well, I can't speak for anybody else, but I'm ready for your question, I think. Okay, so um, the whole parabolic theory, this whole last section, was it developed simultaneously with the elliptic theory or was it, um, was it a more recent development? You know, that's a good question. I know that um, it appears almost exactly the way I'm presenting it in the user's guide. So it occurred, whatever it was developed, it must have decur- occurred at latest uh, concurrently with the user's guide itself. But I can't tell you that for sure. I know that uh, Crandall, Ishi, and Lyons are very, very good about including the history where it's interesting and worthwhile. So I'd imagine they have some comments. I'll see if I can flip through and find an answer to that question. Uh, Let's see. Ah, here you go. It's actually in the very uh, beginning of the notes on section eight on page 50. Uh, The presentation follows Crandall and Ishii's work in reference 48. And 48 is, hold on, I will find that. Ah, here we go. Crandall and Ishii, the maximum principle for semi-continuous functions, differential integral equations, uh, volume three, 1990, on pages 1001 through 1014. It's a big book. <laughs> Very. Okay. Um... So my so from what I'm seeing here, it definitely occurred prior to this paper by about three years, two years. Uh, My guess is that probably it came after the normal theory because a lot of what we see here is almost identical to the standard viscosity theory, standard in air quotes, uh, really with only the major changes being to account for the cylinders and then to account for the fact that you don't need to make a lower bound when you do the comparison principle. Okay. Uh, So any other questions? Um, I think that was it for me. If not, then let's thank our speaker one more time, I guess. Um, so thanks again for the long talk, Zach. <laughs> You're it, welcome. <laughs> it helped us out too. Um, so let me stop recording really quick.
And where's the button? There it is.